You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models in analysis. Our aim is for this podcast to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. I'm glad everyone has joined us for this episode. We are going to talk about some economics that are strange, and our guest explains better than anyone. Denny McMahon is joining us to talk about his book, China's Great Wall of Debt. Denny was a journalist covering the Chinese economy and financial system at Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal. Mr. McMahon was a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He was formerly with Macro Polo, the think tank arm of the Paulson Institute. Before I welcome Denny, I just want to mention that Denny is the first Aussie, and I feel honored to have him on the Book With Legs podcast. Denny, thank you for joining me today. G'day, Cole. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me as well. So uh, I need to tell you first that your book did such a great job of describing how bizarre the economic system of China has become uh, with great stories, really kind of getting into the people on the ground, which I, I really enjoyed. I have to ask you, what inspired you to write the book? Well, th this came off the back of my reporting at the Wall Street Journal. So I started at the journal covering China's financial system uh, about a year after the global financial crisis. So, so that was about the moment that China officially started petering off its, its stimulus program. And over that period, my focus was on kind of the craziness that had evolved or was evolving before my eyes in China's financial system. And so that was looking at the shadow banking system. It was looking at things like urbanization and zombie companies. Um, and, you know, I was traveling around the country seeing all this waste and excess um, and perverse incentives leading to really strange financial outcomes. And over time, I realized that these weren't disconnected individual stories um, and that there was a real thread running through it. Now, as, as a journalist, when you kind of have to bounce from story to story and, and you typically don't get more than 1500 words to, you know, explore any given idea, mm -hmm. I kind of really needed to step back and have the time and the space to kind of put my thoughts together and put all this together to actually get a sense of how China's economy works from the ground up. And this that's what this book is. It was really a cathartic experience bringing together the, the breadth of what I'd done at the journal just to try and make sense of it all. And obviously things have changed since you wrote the book, um, which came out in 2018. Um, but things have changed a lot in terms of kind of the West view of China. Um, you have a great quote in your book, uh, from Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, uh, you quoted him saying, quote, what if we could be China just for a day? Um, we could actually, you know, authorize the right solutions, end quote. He said that in 2010. I, I remember the West talking about it in that kind of context where if we could only have more control, we might be able to get things done. Um, did you see that a lot in, in, in journalism then? And how do you look at that compared to now? Yeah, there was this real sense that, uh, you know, the West was dysfunctional and China seemed to be able to get things done. I mean, the great example being China's high speed, uh, high speed rail network. I mean, China just, you know, built from scratch, not only the world's biggest high speed rail network, but the biggest by an order of magnitude. I and mean, nowhere else in the world has anything comparable to what China has built. And meanwhile, in so, in so many other places in the world, the US most notably, there are still these ongoing debates about where they should be built. Should they be built? How do we build it? Um, and so there was this sense of like, you know, our own countries are so dysfunctional, the Chinese just get stuff done. But where I was, I was seeing China being dysfunctional in a completely different way 
way. And that what they managed to do is be able to, by hook or by crook, come up with the financial resources, power on through you know, to get stuff done, regardless of, of local interests, and to the outside of that look like huge success. But what they were really doing up is storing up massive problems, and eventually they would have to pay the piper. And that's kind of what we're seeing at the moment, because there was so, you know, in terms of what they built, it didn't come for free. There was a price tag attached, and it the, the waste and the excess was was absolutely inordinate. So I, I think over time things have changed a little bit. I think you know we don't look to China anymore as you know if only we could be more like that, uh, more like them. But I, I think the degree to of understanding of just how dysfunctional China's economic system can be I'm, I'm not sure that's fully petered through into the into the western appreciation of, of that economy as yet and you pointed out uh that's the west at large but then you look at you know you're from australia originally um you quote uh the former prime minister tony abbott and when he was asked you know what's your relationship with china it's fear and greed um how troubling is the relationship for countries like australia or other countries with large economic ties? Yeah, it's a complicated question um, because you know, Australia has done incredibly well out of its relationship with China. I mean, there was a, a period of time where no matter what we dug out of the ground or whatever we produced, the Chinese were willing to buy. And, and so if you kind of look at what Australia was selling to China at its peak, it was you know, the obvious things, you know, LNG, uh, coal, iron ore, but then it was everything from sort of wheat to live uh, um, live uh, lobsters to berries and fruit to you know lavender stuffed toys. Um, you know, in Australia, uh, Australian produced vitamins and dairy hugely popular in China. Um, and then the relationship, the political relationship um, between the two countries, has soured progressively and and over the last year or so or the last 18 months quite dramatically um, to the point that effectively uh, China stopped importing from Australia a large number of very significant imports and so they you know th there hasn't really been an explicit ban on any of these things China's kind of used uh, you know administrative measures to uh, prevent things from coming in uh, effectively told importers and, and Chinese companies to stop buying from Australia um, and so the big ticket items in particular things like coal the Chinese have stopped importing from Australia you had um, shipments of coal from Australia effectively sitting off the Chinese coast for months because the Chinese wouldn't give us a straight answer as to whether it was allowed in or not um, and pretty you know, wine as well and so th it, this was clearly an exercise in economic coercion because China has done this to a, a number of other countries before um, you know South Koreans the Norwegians the Phil uh, the Philippines a whole lot of countries have done something a particular incident to incur China's wrath and China has responded by cutting off access to their market for a key export of that country but they'd never done it before on the scale to which they'd sort of imposed these measures on Australia and it, it was fairly clear at the time that this wasn't just about Australia this was going to be a lesson to the rest of the world that you know if you want continued access to China's market markets you kind of have to play ball because uh, you know China China can turn off the spigot as, reg uh, as readily as they can turn it on. The strange thing is, though, is it did not go according to plan because Australia, for all intents and purposes, managed to reroute most of its exports. And I think in some ways that's the advantage of having a, a commodities-based uh, market. China, Australia, I think most of its coal went to India. Uh, wheat, for example, I think most of it ended up in the Middle East. Um, there, there, there were a whole lot of, uh, I don't want to say tricks, but there were a whole lot of measures that the Australian export machine managed to employ to find new markets and uh, effectively, that they didn't entirely come off scot-free, but there wasn't a significant impact on, on, China, on, on Australia's economy. So, the lessons of this are twofold. One, China's ability to exercise economic coercion isn't perhaps as great as everybody had it, thought it was in the first place. The second thing is that in some ways Australia is in a unique position because its exports are commodity 
uh, are largely bulk commodities, which means you know the globe has global markets for bulk commodities. If one market gets shut off and decides not to buy from a particular source, well, they have to buy from another source. And so everything just gets shuffled around. And just because China isn't buying our stuff, somebody else will. Now, not every economy is in the same position. If you take an economy like Germany, for example, which uh, its economic relationship is with China is huge, but what they mainly expect are sort of big ticket items, but, but manufactured goods and capital goods. Now, if China stops buying what the Germans sell, there isn't another market that's readily going to swoop in and, and take up the excess. So, you know, it, it, Every, those countries that have a significant export exposure to China uh, are, do kind of have to work out how to manage the potential for that relationship to go sideways, but everyone is in a slightly different position based on what that export mix actually is. You commented in your book that the former finance minister of China, uh, Lo Jiwe, uh, said they needed to stop the accumulation of leverage but he said the economy can't lose speed. Uh, not to cast a pall over our conversation, but I, I got the strong sense early in, in your writing that you were skeptical of whether that could be done. I, I, is that correct or am I reading that wrong? No, I was. When I was writing the book, I was like, you know, they, you know, I can't see them being willing to allow economic growth to fall below a certain level. Um, and the thing about Lowe in particular is he's always been a bit of an outsider. He's sort of one who speaks truth to power, but isn't particularly popular within the system. So when he was talking along those lines at the time, I wasn't convinced that would happen, but increasingly it is. So for years, there was this sense that China, it wasn't a sense, it was a, a an expression within the system that economic growth had to be maintained above 8%. Um, and even the 8% was a minimum. So during that period, China was growing in excess of 10% and sometimes 11%. But those days are, are well and truly over. I mean, you know, in the fourth quarter of last year, year on year economic growth came in below 5%. And it's been gradually getting lower year on year. It would have still been getting lower even if the, the pandemic hadn't happened. So there is this genuine downshifting of the economy um, and the reason is because they know they can't rely on this generation of excessive levels of debt anymore to generate growth. And they had been dependent on that happening. And they realized if, if that kept going, going along on its merry way, then they were just storing up bigger and bigger problems um, that, that may have eventually exploded in their face when they were least ready for it. So... Incentive structures are something we chatted about before the podcast, and, and I, I think a lot of Munger, um, he's talked a lot about incentive structures, and the incentive structures that you lay out in your book are crazy. Um, it, it, it's stranger than fiction in some respects, um, if not completely uh, crazy. Um, you point out that subnational governments have 80% of the expenditures, but only collect half the taxes. The national government then provides money back to the lower governments as kind of a subsidy, what kind of incentives does that create in the country? And then since it's a one party country, what does that do in the party? Yeah. Um, so the, the other thing to keep in mind about that redistribution model that you just pointed out is that when the central government sends resources back to the provinces or back to the local governments, it typically earmarks them. So it's not like, oh, okay, we got all this extra money. We're sending it back your way. Do as it as you will. They go, so we've got some money for you, but our priorities, um, just to give you an example of what Xi Jinping's have been for the last couple of years, our pri priorities are uh, poverty reduction, uh, environmental cleanup and improving public services. So the money we're giving back, giving back to you have to be used explicitly in these sorts of ways. Now that creates all sorts of problems because traditionally the way that local government officials get assessed, so the metric by which they are judged as to whether they are a successful official or not, particularly if they're a governor or a city mayor, is the degree to which they are able to generate economic growth at a local level. And a sub-metric, which is equally as important, is their ability to generate taxation. So they're in this position where the amount of 
the volume of funds over which they have discretionary control is heavily circumscribed. But they have to do something while they're in charge to be able to economic, uh, stimulate economic growth. And they have to do it at least as well as their neighbors and everybody around them. And so you, you ended up with this situation uh, which just went from bad to worse over the last 20 years, whereby all land in China is owned by the state. And regardless of who's occupying it, it is owned by the state. And so you have this situation where local government officials would expropriate land from farmers, sell it off, rezone it firstly, rezone it from agricultural land to uh, uh, residential land, sell it off at a higher price to developers um, who would then build housing. But then the local governments would take that money that they got and uh, use it to build infrastructure. And the reason they do that is, you know, these city government mayors, typically they have a, a tenure of five years, but more often than not, they get moved on with it and upwards, uh, uh, you know, after three years. So the easiest way to be able to stimulate economic growth in a three year period is not to come up with some brand new long-term strategy for fostering new industries, no, it's to borrow money and to build something. And that is kind of what this whole land, you know, this, this whole sort of land expropriation model came from. So local governments don't have the resources to, to stimulate economic growth. They expropriate land, sell it at a higher price, build something, um, borrow money against future land sales, um, you know, build more stuff with that. And so you end up with this situation where local governments end up being heavily indebted and the official that borrowed the money, having proved their worth as a successful official, then gets moved onward and upward. And then the next person has to come in. The next person comes in, has the same incentives, the same constraints. The only problem is that they are now presiding over a, a, a local government with a, a significantly more heavy debt burden, but they just repeat the whole cycle. And this has kind of been what we've seen over the last 20 years. Local governments have accumulated more and more debt at the same time that they have expropriated more and more land from, lo you know, from local farmers in this kind of one-off privatization of a state resource. Um, and this is where a lot of the waste that I was talking about before came into it because you know, what was important for local officials was not to build infrastructure that would be of value, it was more just to build something. And so you know, I've been to cities with ornamental lakes and you know, cities that have tried to recreate a version of the Great Wall of China and, and create a, a tourism industry from scratch with a, a you know a fake great wall you know all, all these sorts of things which aren't really you know value added infrastructure projects but it didn't really matter because the whole uh, process of building it stimulated growth in a sufficiently short time period and the person responsible for it is no longer there when the when when the bill comes due you point out that they cannot raise taxes um, because of the political structure of this all. Um, and you argue, therefore, that's why the development business is so good. What do governments do when they can't develop land? Um, well, I guess this is a, 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 an issue that we're looking at at the moment um, with the, you know, the, the problems that have sprung up around Evergrande. I mean, clearly what we're seeing with China's prop, you know, property market market at the moment is no longer about Evergrande. Plenty of other de developers have defaulted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, land sales are falling, um, you know, land prices, uh, sorry, uh, uh, housing prices are starting to fall. Developers are becoming less willing to start new construction projects. And so local governments are not able to sell as much land as they used to be. And now that's going to create all sorts of problems for two reasons. One, because they have fewer resources with which to stimulate local growth. And secondly, they have fewer resources with which to pay off their existing debt burden. So it now comes back to this question you just asked, what do they do? So the central government has been talking for years about introducing a property tax, literally years. When I was a, a journalist, it, it was something that we were constantly watching for. Officials were constantly talking about, but year after year, it never got rolled out. The most we've seen so far is a trial in Chongqing and in Shanghai. But if you take Shanghai, for example, the revenue from that property tax 
uh, is only about 10% of the amount of money that the city raises each year from land sales. So it's not really a substitute for, for the selling of land. So ultimately what usually happens when a local government is really hard up for cash, they raise fees and they raise fines. So it's, it's by hook or by crook, they kind of look for other sources of revenue. So, you know, to be able to use the national, the, the local park, fees will go up. Uh, parking fees will go up. Parking fines will go up. Uh, companies will all of a sudden discover that they are in violation of some uh, environmental regulation that uh, hadn't been an issue up until now. Uh, small companies will be told that they have to attend uh, compulsory training sessions for something or other, uh, and they have to pay through the nose for the, privilege, for the privilege to attend. So by hook or by crook, local governments start trying to squeeze both the local population and local businesses, and in particular, small private businesses. Now, Beijing tries to stop that and have been pretty explicit that this sort of behavior is is not on, partly because Beijing is very enthusiastic about trying to help support small businesses and entrepreneurialism. But local governments don't have too many other options available to them. So, you know, that is pretty much the only solution available to them. And, and that's the sort of behavior that you see. Can you teach our listeners about those businesses you talked about just a second ago, carrying three sets of books? Uh, yeah, so there there is an old idiom in China that uh, your typical private business carries three sets of books: uh, one for their banker, one for the tax man, and a legitimate one for themselves. There's also a, another expression that says that some even have four sets of books, the fourth being for their spouse. Um, but the idea <laughs> is that the, the idea is that and this is this is one of the reasons that uh, it, sort of a, a big traditional problem in China's financial system is that the banks have been unwilling to lend to the private sector and in particular to small private firms. Now, to a certain extent, that is a problem globally, uh, that small firms never have access to credit to the degree that they ideally need. But it, it's certainly a bigger problem in China where the banks are, are, are temperamentally predispo predisposed to lending to the state sector. And one of the reasons that the, the authorities have had so much trouble getting the banks to pivot is because of this problem of the three sets of books. The banks don't really know, you know, when they ask for, you know, to, to you know, to, to, to see a, a private sector company's books, they don't really know what they're seeing. Is this the legitimate version or should they just assume that they are seeing a gussied up version, which is a, effectively a sales pitch? Um, but it is a, a, a genuine problem and it, it's a reason why China's banks have been so reluctant to lend more than they do to the private sector. You point out to your readers that China's media has referred to all this debt and waste that's kind of built up over time in these practices as original sin. Um, I found this to be just such an odd term to hear from a government media uh, dominated society. Um, it's a spiritual term. Do you find this strange? I mean, does does this actually describe kind of the spiritual nature of the culture? You know, I always found that expression quite strange as well. When it first popped up, it, it seemed quite out of character. And, and to be honest, you don't really hear it anymore. Um, I, I, I don't really think it reflects anything fundamental about China. Um, I, I think it was just a, a pithy term that the media kind of, you know, gloamed onto. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it, it really says that much about, uh, about, about China. So coming from Australia, your father obviously was involved in, in building some of the mine businesses, um, and you bring your readers into this uh, city of Erzong and the, the, the steel business. Um, this has kind of been a common strategy of China, you know, low margin, commodity oriented markets. Um, can you kind of explain the basic premise of China's strategy in, in these type of businesses? So there if you look at the the businesses china really dedicated resources to when it was you know pretty much from the turn of the century so you know early on you had a lot of uh sort of ground up uh, businesses in light manufacturing, but when China really started dedicating financial resources to business, it uh, to industry, it went into things like steel and glass and producing paper, um, construction machinery, cons construction, shipbuilding. 
Um, and the interesting thing about all of these industries is that they don't kind of conform with the vision that we have or the understanding that we had of China as being a, a low cost manufacturing center. You know, the idea was that the, the sort of businesses that would naturally migrate to China would be those that would take advantage of low cost labor. These sorts of businesses, you know, uh, you know, steel, paper, glass, they're all capital intensive and they also typically are energy in intensive as well. Um, and so the only way that these industries were really able to thrive was the provision of state subsidized capital in huge volumes. And now the reason China kind of, you know, embraced these sorts of industries is because they were seen as being an you know, important step up the value added chain. And they were also incredibly important in terms of um, supporting uh, the development of other Chinese industries and other dr growth drivers. So particularly when we're kind of looking at things like, you know, uh, you know, power production and steel and glass and, you know, shipbuilding and cement, cement generation and construction machinery. I mean, all of these I I businesses, either directly or tangentially, fed into China's urbanization and uh, uh, you know, urbanization drive. And if you kind of look at where China's growth has been really for the last 20 years, I mean, we're always inclined to think, well, this has been an export miracle. And certainly early on, exports were vitally important to China's economic transformation because that's where they got you know, foreign currency. Um, but what's really driven growth has been, um, you know, has been real estate and, and kind of, you know, let's say real estate writ large. So not just the construction of housing, but also infrastructure construction as well. So these days, the property sector accounts for about, you know, 30% of China's economy. And, you know, it, the, one of the reasons it's so big is that this is not just about building. This is about all the supporting industries which are connected to the success of, of, of real estate. And this is kind of one of the reasons at the moment why Beijing's efforts to try and uh, reduce the, uh, you know, sort of deleverage the property sector a little bit and reduce its contribution to economic growth is such a, a radical uh, you know, a radical undertaking because this is not just about builders. There is an entire economy that is connected to what goes on in the real estate sector. You know, the, the steel, the cement, you know, the shipbuilding, which is necessary to bring in the, the coal from overseas, which is necessary to, to power the, 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 the coal-fired power plants that are necessary to make the steel. So it, it's all sort of interconnected. Um, but as that sort of gets paired back, it's, it's going to have a significant impact on China's economy. As they get deeper into these commodity markets, though, their strategy has evolved. You talk about them stepping in uh, on the BHP Billiton buyout in 2014 because they recognize that that would be a harm to China for those type of markets that you're talking about. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Um you know, I think they look at, going back to the question you asked before about uh, how Australia has dealt with, uh, you know, the, the question of fear and greed and economic coercion from China. You know, when you look at all the industries that China, uh, all, all the export, all the Australian exports that China curtailed over the last 18 months, you know, there were some big ones like coal, but they didn't touch iron ore. Um, and the reason is, I think China regards the fact that its iron ore supply is uh, is controlled effectively effectively by three major companies and, and four, if you include include Fortescue, they see it as a strategic liability. And particularly when three of those four com uh, country uh, companies all come from the the one country, that is you know uh, diplomatically uh, very close to the United States. So. China does look at its commodity markets as more through more than just an e economic prism. It looks at them very much through a security pr a security prism, uh, not just in its ability to be able to maintain supply in periods of disruption, but also in terms of its own you know domestic security in terms of keeping inflation under control, keeping the population um, happy, um, and that's why food security is perennially a, a major concern at the top of the minds of of, of China's authorities, and, and when pork prices 
you know, uh, spring up or, or when, uh, you know, accessing supplies of, of, of soybeans or something, you know, you know, supply titans for whatever reason. I mean, it's, it's very much all hands to the pump in Beijing to, to make sure they can get those issues under control quickly. You point out that these state-owned companies and these industries that we're talking about, their debt is corporate debt, but it's really government debt. As we watch these corporate issuers have trouble in China, like we talked about in the developer space, do you see the government being willing to stand behind these always, or will there be times that they just step away? Yeah, that is something that has a question that's come into very stark relief over the last few years, because I think it's fair to say that um, everybody, both inside and, and outside of China, assumed that all state-owned enterprises, when they borrowed money, whether they issued a bond or they borrowed from a bank or they borrowed through some shadow banking mechanism, that at least some level of government stood behind that debt. Now, over time, it's become increasingly apparent that you know, some state-owned enterprises have more backing than, than others. Some state firms are, are more strategic than others and have greater significance to a local authority, uh, either because of the amount of tax revenue that they bring in, because of the, the number of people that they employ uh, for prestige reasons, for, for whatever reason, just maybe just because of their sheer size. But even then, things are getting complicated. Uh, we saw this at the end of 2020 um, in Henan province in particular, but also in, in Tianjin, that a number of large state-owned enterprises, firms that you would have assumed had the sort of full backing of at least the provincial authorities, if not the city authorities, um, that they defaulted on their debt and the local authorities did not have the resources to be able to step in. So the question of just how legitimate or valuable an implicit guarantee is, is one that is getting a lot of attention at the moment. So to, to go into this a little bit more detail, because it is both fascinating and it's a bit of a moving target. If you look at China's um, interbank market, right? So China has... Uh, something like 60 listed banks. It has about 100 city commercial banks, 800 rural commercial banks, and probably a couple of a thousand very small village or, or, or rural, rural banks. Um, and so you have the interbank market. A major way for the banks to lend to each other is through negotiable certificates of deposit. So it's effectively these are you know these are these are, are bonds uh, between three you know typically maturing between three months and, and one year. Now up until the beginning of two thousand and nineteen, if you were a a bank, city commercial bank, rural commercial bank, that was triple A rated. So we're talking about the biggest provincial banks. These aren't your joint stock banks. These aren't your Minshungs and Pingans, and they're certainly not your national banks like ICBC or Bank of China. These are the biggest provincial banks in each China, in, in each province. They, you know, biggest provincial banks in each province, AAA rated, they could all issue debt, like an NCD, at pretty much the same yield as each other. Didn't matter where they were from, from Liaoning province, from Zhejiang province, all the same. Now, at the beginning of 2019, a large provincial bank in the province of Inner Mongolia got taken over by the central bank and the banking regulator. And as part of the workout of that bank, banks that had lent to this bank, Baosheng Bank, in the interbank market, they had to take a haircut for the first time ever. So all of a sudden it became clear that lending to other banks wasn't a risk-free proposition. So what happened then? Well, all of a sudden you started to get this divergence in risk pricing between the banks. Now, but it was, it was a, div a really interesting divergence and not something that you typically see in a developed market. So even to this day, for banks, you know, the biggest banks, AAA rated banks in, the, you know, in most provinces, they can still issue debt at exactly the same yield. So if a bank, AAA rated, you know, large bank, local bank in Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Shandong, Yuna, all the, most of these provinces can all issue at exactly the same rate. Doesn't, you know, no one's taking any, into account, you know, differences in risk between the banks. It's all the same. But for a handful of provinces... The banks in those provinces have to can only issue it at a significantly higher yield. So if you take Liaoning province, or you take Heilongjiang, or Jilin, or Inner Mongolia, Henan, Tianjin, Shanxi, and uh, Shanxi, Gansu, Guangxi, 
it's the the cost of raising debt is is more ex- expensive. But the really interesting thing here, though, is that you know you take Liaoning Province, three big banks, all triple A rated, still that the they issue debt at different yields. It's all higher than all their peers, but it's not the same for those three banks within the province. And so what that says is that when and this comes back to the the, the question of the implicit guarantee, that the way that investors that bond buyers that the banks themselves in China are pricing risk is that they assume that for most provinces most provinces are willing and able and have the resources with which to fully back their banks in case of some sort of liquidity event but some banks some provinces those guarantees aren't worth as much as they used to be and so you've, you've kind of got this very you know, strange emerging situation where you know, the, 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 the implicit guarantee, people are starting, the banks in particular are overtly aware that depending on where an institution is based geographically in China and depending on what government is backing you, a guarantee might be more valuable than based on other places. It's, it's a fascinating space. It's, it's, evolving, it's evolving rapidly. But it's also a, a, something that I don't think is, is generally, a, a generally appreciated outside of, of China, that uh, you know, there are guarantees and there are guarantees and that people are, are starting to rank them. It sounds like a market system is showing up. Um, in, in economics, money always goes where it's treated the best. Um, in the story you tell about Xi'an, the, the Ch- you know, China's motor town, um, capital didn't move fluidly. Here in the United States, if a place is not well fit to provide an industry or a good, it goes elsewhere in our country. Um, can you explain to the listeners what happened there where they could potentially lose their auto business? Yeah, Shiyan is is fascinating, and you know, I I, I give the example of Shiyan in the in the book, and it sounds so weird. It must be an outlier, but so many cities have have experienced something comparable. So what was happening in Shiyan is that it developed its auto industry back in the nineteen sixties as part of what uh, Mao Zedong called the Third Front. So back in the sixties. China had a falling out with the Soviet Union and the Chinese were worried that the Soviets would invade. So rather than have all of its heavy industry concentrated in the Northeast, where traditionally it was, they spread it throughout the country. But not only spread it throughout the country, but they put it in places where it would be most difficult for bombers, Soviet bombers, to be able to destroy. Um, And those places almost invariably were in the mountains. And so this town in Shiyan, in Hunan province, um, you know, has this auto industry that was set up in the 1960s in the mountains. And so that the factories are kind of built, you know, in sort of these narrow gullies and valleys between the hills and valleys. Um, And over time, you know, as China developed its market and foreign firms moved in and set up joint ventures with Chinese firms, foreign firms went in there. I mean, most notably, uh, Nissan set up a, a joint venture with Dongfeng and had an operation there. Now, what happened a few years back is that, um, you know, Nissan, I think, uh, or was it, yeah, I think it, I think it was Nissan or maybe it was its partner, Dongfeng, said that it was moving its headquarters out of Xi'an and it was moving it to another town. I think it was going to Wuhan. And the local officials in this town said that this was their waking, wake up call because they realized what they believed is that this company was moving because it couldn't expand. And the reason it couldn't expand is because they were in the mountains. I mean, to build a factory, you kind of need a big uh, ex- expanses of flat land, and Shu Yan had had all but run out. Um, you know, it, it was effectively already threading its way. You know, in the flat spaces, but you know, between the mountains and the hills, and there was just nowhere else for the factories to to, to grow. And so, its its understanding of the problem was that it was losing business, and not only was it losing business, it was actually losing businesses that were moving out because there was no space for expansion. So the solution was to create flat land. And so what they started doing is flattening the hills. And hundreds of hills, actually, I think it was about 80 hills around the city, uh, they just completely flattened. And when I was there, it was, it was amazing because, you know, I'd been living in Beijing 
for years and Beijing at that time was heavily polluted. Uh, you know, you, you, they would, you'd go for weeks on end without seeing the sky because of this particulate matter and it was grey and it was grimy. And I turned up to Shiyan and it was, you could cut the air with a knife, but it was a different type of dust. It was this this sandy yellow construction dust from where they were flattening all the, all the mountains. Um, and the local officials thought this was an outrageous success because they managed to convince, I think it was Volvo, to move in and, and build a, a facility. But, you know, this was the solution. You know, if they were losing businesses, that the key was to build more land. And this kind of goes back to the perverse incentives you were talking about before, Cole, because, you know, local governments are all competing to attract businesses, right? Uh, and they ideally they like you know uh, heavy industry. They like manufacturing businesses because of the types of taxation that it generates, and because you know it, it sort of you know brings in generally generally sort of relatively low skilled jobs. But the thing is, as you mentioned, local governments have only limited discretion in terms of taxes, in terms of what taxes they can cut or levy or whatnot. They they all have the same menu of taxes and there's only so much that, that, that they can do to attract uh, new investment. So one of the things that they offer is land and typic industrial land. And typically it's free or it's cheap or in some way it, that they kind of use the land to, you know, uh, get you know in investment in, and so for a city like Shiyan, not only was the problem that it was not, yeah, you know, it was seeing businesses leave. As far as it was concerned, it would not be able to attract new investment without being able to hand out free industrial land as an incentive. And if it couldn't do that, then effectively it was all over Red Rover. And so again, these sort of you know strange perverted incentives that not only end up completely changing the face of the city, but really changing the face, the, the environmental profile of the city as, as well. Um, I remember at the time, this was a huge issue what they were doing because um, Beijing was building three massive tunnels to redirect uh, water um, from the Yangtze River up to the north because China's uh, northern provinces are so parched. Um, but this city was on a river that was going to be a ma in a major catchment zone for this new water that was going to go north. And, you know, when you cut down the, these mountains, there's all this runoff and there's all this silt and uh, that, that was sort of going to go into the rivers. And there was this, this big issue as to whether it would be potentially also undermining the northern water supply. Um, but anyway... It's the nature of the beast when you have these strange, perverse incentives that end up in you know, result in strange behavior. You invariably have one knock on effect followed by another. In 2010, we had come across a video uh, from SBS Sydney Broadcasting, uh, their Dateline show, um, do documenting the ghost cities in China at the time. And I remember the South China Mall was very much this prime example they used in a shop owner in that. Um, in your book, the poster child for the ghost city is Tieling. Um, explain this city to our listeners, if you could. Yeah, of course. Well, f firstly, the thing to keep in mind is that Chinese ghost cities turn the whole concept of a ghost town on its head, right? So, you know, the U.S. West is dotted with ghost towns, invariably small towns that, you know, sprung up. 150 years ago in response to, to a gold rush or, or some other commodity boom, the town appeared overnight, the resources petered out, and then everybody left. And then you're left with a town that was once vibrant and thriving and no longer serves a purpose. Now in China, the ghost cities completely turned that on a head because you know, there was never ever any real population. These cities were built from scratch in anticipation that eventually people would move in. Um, and so Tieling up in China's northeast in Liaoning province um, is part of China's rust belt. This was kind of once China's industrial heartland, but it's sort of fallen on hard times. Um, and it's freezing up there as well. I mean, the winters are absolutely brutal. But uh, this, this ghost city of Tieling, the, the way the ghost cities usually work is that they're, they're twin cities. So there's a there's an original city, and then the local authorities decide to build a twin just outside the you know the the, the urban core. And so this new Tierling was built just outside, maybe 20 kilometers away, I think, from from the old Tierling. 
And quite frankly, this new city, and it was a legit, legitimate new city. I mean, it, there was government buildings. There were a couple of office towers. Uh, I think there was a, a tennis center, rows and rows of uh, apartment buildings. There was at least one, maybe two schools, if I remember, and a hospital. It, it was one of the most pleasant cities I'd ever been to in China. I mean, this thing had been landscaped from scratch by one of China's best respected um, you know, urban designers. I mean, that they built this, there was this beautiful lake, um, which they'd dug out, they'd taken the, the soil from the lake and they'd built a man-made hill on the other side of the city. Um, it was built next to a, a, a wetland, which had seen, you know, better days. I mean, it had been really used and abused by the original city. They cleaned out the water, um, and they expanded it. And, you know, traditionally it was a, a migratory point for, uh, my, migratory birds. They'd stopped coming years ago. Now they were coming back. It, it was lovely. It was a really lovely place to, to be. But of course the problem was there was no people and there wasn't any real reason for people to be there. Now, the thing to keep in mind about China's ghost cities is it's when you turn up to one of these places, it's not just you and the tumbleweed. Invariably, these cities, which can house, you know, which are being built to house at least tens of thousand people. When I was in Tieling, I think it, it was equipped for about 100,000 people. There is kind of a kernel, like a core population, because the authorities have all sorts of tricks to get people to move in. So, for example, um, you know, I, when I was in Tieling, I remember somebody sort of dismissively calling it a city of children because a whole lot of the schools in the surrounding county had been closed down and now the kids were forced to either commute to new schools in the new city or they were there boarding. Um, uh, local government officials, for example, they would have had their offices originally in the centre of the old city. Those office buildings had been torn down and now their offices were in this new city. And, and by the same token, you know, not only are they expected to work there, but they're expected then to, to buy apartments in these new cities. So there, there was kind of a core of population. But to make a real city work, you need thriving businesses. And so, of course, Chairling was trying to attract people. It wanted to, you know, there was talk of building a, a Christian-themed um, theme park, which was completely random, given that this part of the country didn't really have any you know, underlying Christian heritage. But at least that was private capital, though. You pointed out in your book that that was a private investor and the government had to toss it around long enough that they never let it happen, which is kind of ironic. It is, it is. But the, uh, that was the vision that was going to be private money moving in. Uh, they built industrial parks to, you know, to, to try and attract, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs. Um, you know, a couple of factories moved in, but certainly nothing to kind of create jobs on the scale that you needed to, to build a city of 100,000 people. And so that was the problem. You know, there wasn't any reason for for people to come to this town, for migrants to move to this town. And, and this was really the problem. Um, a lot, of, you know, China has experienced this massive urbanization boom uh, over the, you know, over the last 30 years. And there was a lot of talk that, you know, there'd be even more people moving from the countryside to the cities. And so it made sense for the cities to get bigger and even to build these sorts of new cities. But the reality is that if you don't have the jobs, and specifically if you don't have the low end, ideally manufacturing jobs that people from the countryside can take up once they move in, well, there's no point for those people to move in in the first place. And so you kind of get this strange situation where in places like Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen, you have a fundamental dearth of quality and adequate um, you know, uh, residential housing. I mean, in Beijing, you literally have tens, if not hundreds of thousand people living underground in effectively, you know, car parks and, and windowless utility rooms because there's just not enough quality housing. And then you've got places like Tieling, which you've got entire cities where nobody is living uh, because there is no reason for people to move in in the first place. Why do economists then write these ghost cities off? I think economists typically look at ghost cities from the perspective of a housing price, housing uh, market problem, right? And, and that's a legitimate way of looking at it. You look at a ghost city and it's like, well, you've got all this empty housing. What does that mean for developers? Surely that's going to create debt problems for developers and it'll, you know, snowball on and it'll affect the banks. And oddly enough, that, that never happened. And the reason is, you know, invariably, most of the housing that has been built in these ghost cities 
um, most of the empty housing that you, you see in legitimate thriving cities all around China, and certainly there's plenty of that as well, it's been bought. So it's not like you have developers that built stuff and no one's buying it, and these developer, these development companies are, are twiddling their thumbs, just going, oh my God, what are we going to do? They built it, people bought it, and the debt was paid off. And so this is less an, you know, a, a housing crisis problem, and it's more, well, firstly, a lot of people have investment um, investment uh, apartments that uh, they never intended to rent out because you, you find that there's kind of a cultural thing that people in China um, buy investment properties to realize the capital gains rather than for the rental income. Um, but, you know, it's empty, but people are, are owning it. Um, the reason I believe that ghost cities, you know, that th th there are economic consequences is because it it feeds back into the economic growth model because these uh, ghost cities and, you know, you find sort of ghost districts on the outskirts of existing cities and ghost suburbs and, you know, ghost industrial parks and all this sort of stuff. What it really speaks to is this model of growth I was talking about before, except on steroids. A, a mayor comes in, he or she has to stimulate the local economy. The best way to do it is to build something and build it quickly. So the mayor of Tierling, for example, the guy who was responsible for this, he was fated nationally for years because he managed to grow the local economy, I think at 20%, more than 20% for like three years in a row. I mean, this was a rust belt province um, and he managed to grow his economy at a, uh, at a, at a pace twice that, more than twice that of, 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 the, of the province more broadly. And so this was a, a huge success, um, partly because the debts only come due later. And this is where the problem is. It is the local government's debt problems because the local government borrowed money to build the infrastructure, not the housing, but the infrastructure. It borrowed money to build the high-speed rail line that goes through the new city and to build the man-made uh, mountain out the back of the town and to build the roads and to build the sewers and install the p power lines and to uh, build the, the tennis center and build all the other incremental things to try and uh, encourage people to come into the city. And to do that, that, they racked up a whole lot of debt. And so this is a problem. One, it's this model of growth that saddled local governments with a whole lot of debt that they are now struggling to pay off. And secondly, once you build this stuff, you spike economic growth, but then you run out of, you know, to, to maintain a pace of growth, you've got to keep replicating it. You've got to, to keep follow, building. You've got to follow up, right? You've got to build. If you built a, 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 a two tennis courts this year, well, to grow next year, you've got to build three. But there isn't any real need for that incremental expansion in um, infrastructure. So you have this situation of local governments being heavily indebted but once they build all their stuff, they don't need to build more except for the political reason that they need to maintain growth. And so that's where the problem is. It is, it is political and it is economic and it's because of, of this debt problem. It's not really a property sector problem. To quote you, it's that the urbanization can support growth, but it can't lead it. And you quoted Milton, Milton Friedman in your book from 1998. He, he called the buildings, quote, a status monument for a dead pharaoh on the level of the pyramids, end quote. Looking back at Friedman's statement, though, don't a lot of the economists look and say, well, Milton, you were wrong? Yeah, well, he was specifically talking about Pudong, which is, um, you know, the eastern side of the river in Shanghai. And he, he was wrong. I mean, you go to Shanghai these, day, these days and that part of Shanghai that he was looking at is China's CBD. I mean, when we think about sort of Shanghai's Blade Runner-esque skyline, that is, he, he was looking at the early stages of what was being developed then. So, no, I mean, if, if you're looking at the if you build it, they will come model of urbanization, which was what Friedman was describing. It has been successful nowhere like it's been successful in Shanghai. It has been outrageously sh successful, partly because Shanghai has always, always had legitimate reasons for people to move from other parts of the country. So there was always this need for more accommodation and businesses would move in. And the very nature of, of Shanghai's own economy is that it creates economic opportunities. Um, you know, like, like almost no, you know, like, like a New York um, or like a London. 
Um, but it's it's these fringe cities that decided to to build ghost cities, to build entirely new cities, where that that model just doesn't work because it just they don't have the same pulling power as a place like Shanghai. It's like they showed up at the party convention and they said, "Hey, this worked here," and they're like, "Oh, hey, the party's doing this elsewhere. Let's let's try it too. Let's let's pivot our conversation though." Um, you you start in 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 the in the story. You talk about what happens in these auction markets with Baijiu, the the Chinese alcohol, which is really, as you lay out, is uh, you know kind of a it's a red party. It's something. It's kind of a relic of the army from Mao. Um, can you explain what Baiju is? Because I my biggest touch with it is I had a good friend. He'll probably listen to this podcast, so he'll get a good chuckle out of this. But he did a summer abroad in China, uh, was learning Mandarin, and he brought it back to our fraternity, and it was absolutely disgusting. It's the worst thing I've ever drank, probably. Um, and I think you do a pretty good job explaining that in your book. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, I, I feel I feel very similarly about Baiju, but you know the the, the Russians have vodka. Uh, the Koreans have soju, the Japanese have sake, and the Chinese have baijiu. But in terms of the hierarchy of those four types of white spirits, baijiu really has to be on the bottom of the the pecking order. Um, there is a to kind of you know go off off track a little bit. There there is this theory that various types of alcohol require a drinker to. To, to drink a certain amount of it, to sort of pass a certain threshold before they are capable of enjoying it. Um, you know, so you have to drink a certain amount of scotch or a certain amount of bourbon before you can kind of sit back and go, you know, I actually quite enjoy that and I can kind of savor it. Um, the theory is that Baijiu's requ- threshold is higher than pr- perhaps any other alcohols, that you need to drink so much of this before you can start appreciating that, that, it's, that it's hardly worth the investment of time and brain cells. Um, but yeah, so what uh, the, 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 the reason you brought this up is that, um, you know, starting about, oh, I guess it's maybe 15 years ago now, that started to really emerge a, a market for aged baijiu. So, so just as, uh, you know, we, we ha- have vintages of wine and as they get older, they get better. Well, the same, as it turns out, applies to baijiu. And baijiu is made out of sorghum and, you know, they're made in a vat. And so the, the actual vintage, so the, the you know, the, the sorghum that was grown in any given year doesn't really matter from one year to the next. But as baijiu gets older, it mellows and becomes easier to drink. And I, I fresh new baijiu, I, I think, is awful. But having now drunk some of this older stuff, I can actually start to see the appeal. It does really mellow with age. And so they sprung up this, yeah, this market for aged baijiu, um, and specifically for Maltai, because Maltai is the premier brand of, of baijiu in China, and partly because it is steeped in Communist Party history. Um, Mao loved it. You know, the Communist Party marched through the town uh, Maltai in Guizhou Province, where it's where it's made d- during its long march, and so it's it's very much steeped in the Communist Party's h- history. Um, but the value of these, uh, you know, I, I, I knew a, an auction owner, an auction house owner, who started putting together. Um, batches of this aged Maltai and started selling it at auction and you know depending on the year and the rarity uh you know the prices were were doing quite well and then year on year the the prices that these things were absolutely skyrocketing um and i think we're what we're looking at the period from about if i remember rightly 2000 and well, probably 2010 to 2015 or 2016 and and the benchmark was um 1985 right because at 1985 maltai there was still a, a sufficient amount out there that you could be sure that every year you'd be selling a fair amount of 1985 maltai and the other reason that they sort of fixated on 85 is because if i remember rightly the 1985 the feet the red mm-hmm. wine from france is kind of the you know benchmark for the feet and at this time i mean the chinese were buying up french vineyards and they were try- buying up french wine uh, you know, age french um red wine and the feet 85 was the gold standard and i remember when the auctions first started they were selling at i think it was a, probably a third of the you know the feet's 85 price and then it went up and then one year they were selling, you know, it was the, the, the same price. And then the last year I sort of checked in on it, it was selling at a significant premium to what a 1985 Lafitte would, would sell for. And of course, no, none of this has 
anything to do with quality or what you know what the market really you know that the relative value of Maltai versus Lafitte. This was purely about cash in the system. And you point this out in other in other goods too. So for example, um, you know uh, Vancouver, British Columbia houses had this in common. Um, you point out a parasitic fungus that was. Uh, used for virility, um, the Chinese soccer club started, you know, buying up talented players on on the European markets. Um, and then, as you teased it earlier, you get out to this lavender farmer in Australia. Um, d- did you chalk up all that to just, uh, you know, conspicuous consumption, kind of a financial euphoric type of atmosphere? It was. It was all of those things, but what was fueling it was, I think Bloomberg coined the phrase, the great ball of money. So, you know, in the years after the global financial crisis, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong a little bit. I know the Western press was very fixated on on the amount of money that the Fed printed and, and the Bank of Japan printed and the ECB printed. But I think, what, 2009 or 2000, say 2009 to 2015, the amount of money created by China's financial system was an order of magnitude greater than the money supply expansion in the US, the, the EU and, and Japan over the same period. But the thing is, the reason it doesn't get as much attention, it was a very different type of monetary expansion because in Japan, Europe and the US, it was being done by the central bank, whereas in China, it was being done by the commercial banks. And so, of course, these were you know different things. But of course, in theory, when a commercial bank issues a loan and thereby creates money, the theory is that, well, this is being done for productive purposes. But of course, in China, that wasn't necessarily the case. So much of the money that was being created was for speculative purposes. And because of these perverse incentives I was talking about before, it was leading to state firms building factories. It was leading to local governments building infrastructure that wasn't needed and developers building housing in places that no one really was going to live in it. And so it was was wasteful, but it was creating money to you know, fuel this waste and excess because of the, the strange you know incentives in, in in the Chinese economic and political system, but you had this massive expansion in money and it 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 went into everything. I mean, it, in, at various times, it inflated you know commodities markets, it inflated China's stock markets. It's a you know it it certainly st- it, it ended up in you know, inflating, uh, you know, the price of aged Maltai and stamps and mahogany furniture and, you know, this, you know, Chinese herbal Viagra that you mentioned before. And of course, it started leaking out overseas as well. So it meant that Chinese people, you know, Chinese entrepreneurs were paying, you know, hand over fist uh, or paying through the nose for European soccer clubs or French vineyards or for 1985 Lafitte. Um, There was just so much money going around and no real productive places to invest it. And so it ended up in, in, in speculative outlets. It sounds like one hell of a party, that's for sure. Um, so in our discussion today, Denny, is there anything that we haven't got at that you think is really important to your story or anything that we missed? I'm not sure there's something we've missed. I mean, the, the thing for me is, you know, I've, my book was published at the beginning of 2018 and already a lot of the distress, they're not the distress, but the excess and waste that I describe was starting to get reined in. So what we've seen is that at the beginning of 2018, pretty much at the time that the book came out is that shadow banking peaked and that, you know, there's been this deleveraging campaign going on over the last few years, such that the shadow banking sector is now a, a shadow, or, you know, it's, it's a shadow of a, what, what it used to be. Um, you know, the banks as well, a lot of their more, you know, sort of uh, outrageous behavior trying to get around regulations, um, you know, colluding with the shadow banking system, that, that doesn't really exist anymore. And I think what really happened is that during the Wild West days in China's financial system, which was really 2010 to the end of 2016, is that the way that all players in the system, uh, you know, the banks, the shadow banks, the state firms, the developers, the local governments, they kind of 
that, that they you know, the central government might try and rein in their behavior and issue new regulations but the, the the theme of the day was that it was important to comply with the letter of what was being asked of them but everybody was sort of flaunting the spirit and then what happened starting in 2016 and, and sort of getting progressively stronger is that that flipped such that it's now more important to adhere with the spirit of what Beijing and Xi Jinping is asking of you as a banker, as a local government official, as a state-owned ex- state firm executive. It is more important to adhere to the spirit rather than the letter of the re- regulations. In fact, if a regulation comes out, what you should do is interpret the spirit of what that regulation is asking and, and go the extra mile. So it's it's not important to adhere to exactly what the regulation is saying. It, it's to, to, to perhaps go a little bit overboard, which of course creates you know its, its own problems. And I think the reason for that shift was Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. You know, it, it, he launched that soon after coming to power in 2012, but it was only by the end of 2016 that I, I think he had consolidated power sufficiently that it became clear to people in the system that the cost of not complying with what was being asked of them had just got too high. And so that allowed Beijing to start deleveraging the system. And part and parcel of that is now what we're seeing with the property sector. Because of course, you know, every, you know, investors have been looking at Evergrande for a decade and sort of saying that it was really a matter of time before something went severely wrong there. But in theory, Evergrande may have been able to kind of keep moving things around, kicking the can for a few years yet, were it not for the government's specific measures to start reining in leverage in the property sector with its three red line policy in the middle of 2020. So the distress that we're seeing in the property sector at the moment isn't kind of the inevitable outcome of of the excess that I've described, but it's a deliberate decision by the central government to deal with that excess now rather than to allow things to get worse and worse and for problems to potentially blow up in their face at some point in the future at a time not of their choosing. So yeah, what the the sort of slowdown and the upheaval and the distress we're seeing at the moment in in China's system, on on one level, it has to happen because of everything that's gone gone before. But the reason it's happening now is a political decision and the authorities are trying to thread a needle. They're trying to minimize the fallout from forcing this upon the economy. So for example, with the developers, they want to see as few defaults as possible. They want to ensure that there's enough credit in the system and enough confidence in the property market that the developers have the cash to pay their bills. But they don't want to make enough credit available such that they reflate the system. Now that's trying to thread a very narrow needle, but that's the game they're playing. And I think that's the that's the dynamic to watch, not just in this year, but for the next few years ahead. Well, and like we saw with Bo Jilao, they're willing to take down anyone next to them in this process as well. Um, Denny, I, I really enjoyed our time with you today, as I'm sure all the podcast listeners have as well. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you guys reaching out. I think the one idea that I'm reminded of out of your book is actually Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I mean, of all these things we talked about, these incentive structures, something is a poor choice, and yet it's cemented in by almost another poor choice or kind of a perverse structure like you talked about. Um, These Chinese policies, good or bad, have a counterforce to hold it in place. Um, So like I said, we love to have you on, Denny. This is a real treat. Um, Denny's book, China's Great Wall of Debt is the best book for understanding how complex the Chinese economy and politics are for people there in the country and the businesses there too. I highly recommend you go buy his book and dig into these incredible stories. The the stories of these people are fantastic. We didn't have enough time to go through all of them, but they're wonderful. Um, For our listeners, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeedcap.com. Again, that's podcast at smeedcap.com. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. I look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.